So last time when I talked to you about the exams, the grader had only graded about 30 of them. And so I wasn't sure if I was getting the true picture. I got the picture turned out in the end to be a little bit better than it was initially. When I first talked to the grader, no one had scored above 70. Turns out the high grade was a 96, and several people got in the 90s, lots of people in the 80s. The test wasn't impossible, that's, that's clear. The top of the distribution, as I said in my email, was very much like past classes. But as you get down around into the 60s and 70s, it starts to tail off at the lower end way more than it has in the past. And I've never seen this many people with scores less than 40 in this class, less than 30 even. And I just can't pass people that can't get above 30 percent. There's just no way. I brought the C's down to 40, and to be quite honest, I'm quite uncomfortable with that. That's way too low. I'm anticipating that you'll do better on the projects, better on the homeworks, better on the final, and pull it up. But just be aware that uh, that was against my better judgment, and you're not in a safe position if you're sitting around there at a 40 in terms of passing this course. And so you're going to need to put more effort in, do more work, do something. As I looked at the lower scores, there was an amazing coincidence between missing homeworks and low scores on the exam. That tells me something important about why it's happening. And I, when those people come to talk to me and they haven't done any homework or they're missing two of the three and they want to know why they got a 33, and you know, it's pretty obvious in those cases why that happened. I'm more concerned with those of you who are putting in the effort and it's not getting through. And so I don't want to lump everyone into the same basket. And then this, this class, I just haven't seemed to connect with this class. And something just hasn't, I don't know, somehow we're not getting it. And we need to somehow fix that. You know, in the past, I've had Cochrane or cut on the midterm as well. And they were responsible for the stuff we did last time, plus everything you were responsible for. And the grades were a little better. And so I'm not sure exactly where the disconnect has happened. I'll, I'll take the blame for it. Maybe this provides a bad incentive, though I've been doing this for the last three times I've taught it, so that doesn't seem to be the, the, the one difference. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on in this particular class. It's sort of explaining the, the slightly lower scores. Maybe it's just you know a bad draw on the midterm or something like that. We'll, we'll see. In any case, for now, I just went ahead with the same old distribution. I assumed it was the midterm's fault and not your fault and sort of adjusted the, the scores appropriately, but, but I'm just uneasy with it. And I, I'd really like to see the people at the lower end of the distribution. You're going to have to put in more effort. This is just not a class that you can plug into the, week, the day, a couple of days before the exam and think you're going to get all the material and pass the course. It just won't work that way, and I tried to signal that. Maybe I was too strident in trying to signal things and be tough and be, you know, good classroom behavior and all that. Maybe that's part of what's going on. I don't know. But in any case, um, I just hope that you won't give up. It's not too late that you'll just start to put the effort in. One thing that's going to happen to the distribution, one reason I gave so many D's and F's is because a substantial number of those people will drop. And so although it looks like it's weighted way towards the lower end, what always happens is you have to weight your midterms more to the lower end because you get the bottom half just drops. Everywhere you'll get massive drops of the people that get Ds and Fs. And then that part of the distribution is gone. And so when you're all done at the end, it's not overweighted. And so it sort of anticipates the drops that will happen along the way. So, so that's part of what's going on. Maybe there's more people sampling courses and, and intending to drop later. I, I just don't know. Um, on the projects, this is a time when people start to get frustrated right away. It seems like a big daunting task. They don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. I start getting frantic emails. They're starting to come already. I don't know what to do with the project. So let's take it a step at a time. The first thing you need to come up with is something you want to test. It doesn't have to be something clever. It doesn't have to be something important. It's just something economic that you want to test. Figure out what the thing is on the left-hand side you want to explain. Figure out the main thing you want to try to explain it with. I want to explain unemployment, and I think it has something to do with government spending. Okay, that's fine. Unemployment's on the left, government spending's on the right. 
But what are all the other things that explain unemployment? What's the list of variables? You want every important variable on the right-hand side of your equation that's going to explain unemployment, not just that one variable. So what you need to do is sit down and think for a while, okay, this is the thing I want to explain, this is what I want to explain it with, this is what economic theory tells me the sign should be. When government spending goes up, unemployment goes up. There's some other weird theories, we get the other result, but basically that's what they mostly say. And so, okay, that's what the theory tells me. But what else needs to be in that equation to explain unemployment? What other sorts of things might affect unemployment besides, because I don't want admitted variable biases in my model. I want to put in all the things that um, explain unemployment and just put those on the right-hand side. And so the first step is simply that, just coming up with a list of variables that are going to explain the thing you want to explain. Then you're going to have to go out and find the data, and that's when it's going to get a little bit harder. With macro data, you're pretty safe. You know it's mostly out there. But with other types of data, you may or may not be able to find it. You may have to go back and adjust what you're looking at in accordance to what data is actually available. So your question may have to be conditioned a little bit on what you can actually answer. There's no sense asking a question you can't possibly answer. There's no data there. And so you may have to iterate back and forth a little bit between, okay, here's the data, here's what I want to look at, and, and how can I make those two things match? Now, the other thing that seems to be quite confusing is I ask about data transformations, logs, and squares, and 1 over x's, and how do I do that? How do I know when to do 1 over x? How do I know when to use x squared? How do I know when to use a log of x? So let me just give you a little bit of guidance on that. Then on Tuesday, I'll ask your questions on your projects, because you'll they'll be due on Wednesday and Thursday. And so if you have questions on Tuesday, we'll start with that. I'll answer some of your questions and, and try to help you, you know, get, get off on a good footing here. Because you're going to learn a lot about how to do econometrics from this, this project. And a lot of it, there is no answer. A lot of it's just the art of econometrics, knowing when to include a variable or not to include, or exactly what form to include it in. It just requires thought. Sometimes there's no fixed rules. Sometimes you just have to sit and think about it and figure out what, what seems to be the best and try it and see what happens. But there are some general things we can say about, about these data transformations. One thing we'll look at in the uh, next class, for example, is that we're going to look at, at the relationship between wages and age. And what you might expect, if you were to put, say, age or time on this axis, or age and wages, you might expect to see a wage profile that rises and then falls towards the end of someone's life. So typically a wage profile will peak in middle age and then it'll actually come down a little bit. They, we, we think they should rise all the way until you retire, but they don't always. So typically what a wage profile might look like this, the relationship between age and wages. <coughs> well, if I try to model wage equals A plus B times H. I'm going to be modeling this with a straight line. And so that relationship is, I'm not going to capture this relationship very well if I just have age in there. But if I add another term, plus C times H squared plus, say, an error, that H squared term gives me the ability to model this quadratic pattern. And so now I've got a quadratic pattern between wages and age. And I can model this kind of a nonlinear relationship by including the, the age and the age squared terms. So if it's a linear relationship, sure, go ahead and use this kind of a specification. But if you've got some kind of nonlinear underlying relationship you can think about, as you think about, well, gee, what, how are my variables related? And it, and it seems like they, they have this parabola shape or, or some shape close to that, then you probably want to include the square of your variable, x and x squared. Because there's, no, there's not a linear relationship, there's a nonlinear relationship. And so often, you know, if it looked like this, you might want to include a, a level and a square term in, in your model. It just depends. The same thing happens when you're modeling a time trend. If you were to model a time trend for the US GDP, Probably a linear trend fits pretty well. So for that variable, you could explain, you know, GDP at T is A plus B times time. 
some time trend, you're going to fit pretty well. So that's a linear relationship. You wouldn't need a time squared. But if that relationship looked different, then I might want to add a time squared to the model to capture that curvature. The other way that you can sort of capture nonlinear relationships is if the variable's growing exponentially. So variables that tend to grow over time, like GDP, employment, those sorts of variables, consumption, investment, they grow over time. If you hit a variable with, say, a 3% growth rate, a constant growth rate, it'll look like this over time. If you, just, if you just graph x against time, and that's growing at a fixed percent, it'll have this kind of a relationship. Now, I might be able to capture that with a quadratic, but I could also capture this by taking the log of x. If I take the log of x in this case, it's going to make it linear. So if I have a variable that's growing exponentially, if I then look at, the, at, at time versus the log of x, then it tends to be a straight line. So any time you have a variable that tends to grow at some rate on average over time, like GDP, consumption, investment, those kinds of things, you're going to want to take the log of it. The money supply, you want to take the log of it. Variables that are percentages, like interest rates, don't take the log of it. Basically, what logging does is make it into a percentage. Don't worry about that. If it's already a percentage, you don't really need to do it. But, but you don't need to log percentage variables. Like the unemployment rate, you wouldn't want to log that, the percentage. Employment, you would want to lag. But the rate itself, the percent, is a fairly stationary variable. It doesn't go up over time like this. So anything that's growing, you'll want to use it a log. If you've got some sort of underlying nonlinear relationship, you're going to want x's and x's squared in there. Anytime you have, you think, a multiplicative relationship underneath, like yt is a x1 to the alpha x2 to the beta, right? Some, something that looks like some multiplicative relationship. Then we know that if you take the logs, you make it linear. So whenever you suspect you have multiplicative relationships underneath, you want to take logs, because that will linearize those multiplicative relationships. But basically, you just have to think, OK, what is the relationship between government spending and unemployment? Do I think it's linear? Do I think it's nonlinear? Do I think it changes depending on the level of government spending in any significant way? If so, then you need to build that into your model somehow with logs and squares or something like that. If you think it's completely linear, then you don't have to worry so much about those sorts of things. But it's a matter of taking your problem and thinking through it, thinking about the underlying thing you're testing, and thinking about the shape you think that relationship ought to have. Once you, un once you solve that, then you can start to think about data transformations. But you first have to have a notion of what your data look like. It doesn't hurt to plot them. You can graph your data and see if it has one of these patterns. Right? You could graph GDP against time and see if it has this pattern. It does, okay, I should take the log of it. But you pretty much know what variables are growing and what aren't. And so if it's growing, you want to use a log. In macro, we must always use log of GDP, log of the money supply, log of consumption, log of investment, any variable like that that's growing over time. We almost always use logs as we investigate. Question? Once you get that far, you're pretty much done. The only other thing you really need to talk about then is what kinds of problems you suspect you'll run into in your project. And that really depends upon the type of data that you're looking at. If you have time series data, you're going to be mostly concerned with autocorrelation, those kinds of time series problems. If you have cross-sectional data, you're going to mostly be worried about heteroscedasticity. And so 
And you want to say that. I'm not worried about autocorrelation because I am worried about heteroscedasticity because I have a scale variable on the right hand side. And we know scale variables often cause heteroscedasticity. I have a variable on the right hand side that's known to be persistent, like GDP or something like that. I suspect I'm going to have autocorrelated errors. So I'm going to have to check for it. And if I have them, I'll fix it this way. If I have heteroscedasticity, I'll fix it this way. So think of an hypothesis. What's on the left? What are you explaining? What are you explaining it with? What else goes in the regressions? What's the shape of the relationship? How do I model it appropriately? And what problems do I think I'll run into? And that's, you know, that's basically it. That's, that's, that's what you need to do. I'm not expecting that in a week you're going to finish your projects. This is an attempt to push you, get you off to the start, and then I'll keep having benchmarks along the way so you don't wait till Thursday if it's due on Friday to start. I should be amused or offended when I talk about people that really didn't know it. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? It's kind of a stupid question, but how can we ask questions that are actually obtainable? or actually testable? As long as you can find data, you're going to be OK. And so it's really the art of asking questions where data is out there that's going to allow you to get at them. Um, that's the best answer I can give you at this point, unless you have a bad follow-up. Um, I mean, don't think you have to ask really hard questions. I mean, is consumption negatively related to the interest rate? That's fine. Is investment negatively related to the interest rate? That's fine. Should we have a model in mind, or is it just like a social question? You well, if you took investment, you'd say to yourself, okay, well, I know from my macro class that investment's a function of interest rate, income, recent past incomes, expected future incomes. So the things that I expect ought to affect investment, we'd expect in future economic conditions, current economic conditions, interest rates. And so then you'd want to come up with proxies for those sorts of things. The interest rate you can get, you want the real interest rate or the nominal interest rate. And if you need the real interest rate, which you do, how do you measure the real interest rate? So I have to take the nominal interest rate minus some measure of inflation to get a real interest rate. And then that, that'd be one of my right-hand side variables. I think GDP also affects this, so I might want to put GDP. Then I might want to go out and find some leading indicators, either some forecasts or something like that. So there's a, if you look in like the FRED data set, there's a set of leading indicators. So I might want to put in some leading indicators to capture expectations about the future. Or if someone were to ask me, I could, I could send them to the Michigan survey data that has expectations of businesses about the future. So you can put that in your model. So now you'd have investment as a function of the interest rate, current income, expected future income, and you can start to think of, well, is there anything else that I'd be in that investment equation? So it's just a matter of taking some macro relationship or micro relationship, thinking through what it ought to be, telling me about that, what I just did, and then, you know, that'd be a good, you know, I'd be very, very happy with that especially if you caught the nominal real interest rate thing, which most people wouldn't catch. <laughs> so. just, just that kind of a process, you know, consumption's a function of disposable income, the interest rate, same sorts of things. There's habit persistence, so you'd want to include lag consumption because 
if you're used to low consumption, it's a Beverly Hillbilly story, and you suddenly discover oil and get real rich, you don't, you're still eating possum for a few months. You know, what you used to consume matters, so you want to lag consumption in that relationship. You might want expect, expected future conditions, because that may affect consumption. So you may want these leading indicators again. And you'd want present disposable income, because we think that matters. And so you just think through all the things that ought to affect consumption, throw those in on the right-hand side, then start thinking, well, gee, I've got incomes at growth variable. I probably want to use the log of income on the right-hand side. I don't need the log of interest rates, and, and, and so on. So I'd probably regress you know, the log of consumption on the log of disposable income, some measure of real interest rates, some measure of expected future economic conditions, and also lag consumption to pick up this habit persistence. And then I'd be sure in that case to test my errors for autocorrelation to make sure I'd gotten rid of all the autocorrelation, all of the habit persistence in my model. And so I would suspect that consumption would have autocorrelated errors because of that habit persistence, and I may not have captured it all. So that, that's the kind of process I'm, I'm hoping people will, will go through. Money demands, a function of income, and the interest rate. Things like that. Basically what I'm doing is taking y, let's see of y minus t and some other stuff plus i of R and some other stuff plus G plus you know, hex plus. Okay, you can explain this, you can explain this. M, B over P equals M over Y over R. You can explain this. There's lots of relationships. You can try to explain the consumption function, the investment function, money demand, or some other macroeconomic relationship. Just, you know, just pick something and test it. Chapter 8. Again, on Tuesday, I'll come in and ask about questions on the projects. So if you have them, bring them. Chapter 8 is on stochastic regressors. and measurement error. We've already looked at this topic to some extent. All stochastic regressors means is that you have random variables on the right-hand side. So we started When we first started looking at these models, we assumed the X's were fixed in repeated samples. They were chosen by the investigator. They were non-random. So initially, we took the very easy case where these X's are non-random. In the last chapter, which skips past this and assumes some of this material, so we had to pick, we've already done some of this. In the last chapter, we did things like add lagged y here, and that's a random variable. So in the last chapter, we've already allowed for these x's to be random, but we want to do that again. So we're going to generalize what we've done already and let the x's be random. Now the main problem here, when the x's become random, is sometimes the x's are going to be correlated with the error. Whenever the x's are correlated with the error, you have a bias and potentially a consistency problem. You may or may not, you always have a bias problem. So whenever the X's and the U's are correlated, you have a bias problem. And the minute you allow stochastic regressors, random X's is a better way to say that. The minute you allow random X's, you have the possibility of bias. 
So we have to learn how to start looking for this bias by taking P-limbs, by looking at consistency. And it's not hard. But there's one little, two little tricks we need to realize. Once we get those tricks down, this is not hard. So let's go through how to do this. So we basically violated two of our assumptions that we had earlier. So we're replacing the assumption that said the x's were fixed with an assumption that says the x's can be random. And because the x's are random, sometimes we'll violate the assumption that says x and u are correlated. So that's what this chapter is all about. Now, the basic way we're going to check all this, let me just review what we've done in the past. For a two-variable model, for yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x2i plus ui, we, are, we know that beta 2 hat is the sum of the xi minus x bar times yi minus y bar over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. And then what we showed is that this was beta plus the sum of the xi minus x bar times ui, technically minus u bar, but u bar is zero. The errors have zero mean, so I'll just leave it off. Over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. I'm hoping you've seen that enough times so you know how to get from those two steps. Is that true or false? What do you do? You just plug in yi minus y bar into here, and you'll get this. You know how to do that? Can you go from here to here? That's something you should have learned last quarter. Y bar beta 1 plus beta 2 x bar plus u bar. That's going to be 0. <coughs> so y i minus y bar yi has got beta 1 minus beta 1 is beta 2 times xi minus x bar plus ui minus u bar, but that's 0. And the beta 1's cancel. Plug that into there, and that just pops right out. Because you get the beta 2 times xi x bar xi x bar, so you get xi minus x bar squared times beta 2. That's where that comes from. And when you multiply that times that, that's where this term comes from. <coughs> this is the sum of the xi minus x bar beta 2 times xi minus x bar plus ui over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. So that times that is xi squared times beta 2. So you just get a beta 2 because that and that cancels with that. And then you get this times this is that term. So this is the formula that we'll use again and again and again and again and again to evaluate bias. Because if this equals this, it's unbiased. If the expected value of this is this, or the p-min of this is this, it's unbiased or it's consistent. So if this term is non-zero, this doesn't go to beta, either in the limit or by expected value. So it always comes down to checking whether this term goes to zero 
either an expectation. If you're doing bias, you take the expected value of this. If it's zero, it's, it's unbiased. If you're doing consistency, you let n go to infinity and see if this goes to zero. And if it does, it's unbiased. This has to go to zero under, under either the biased or consistency arguments. Then that's equal to that. So, so we're going to use this. We're going to be looking at bias. We'll use this repeatedly to look at that, that question. Now, what we use is the fact that if A and B are independent, then the expected value of AB is equal to what? EA times EB. That's the key thing that you use to, to do this proof. So in the usual case, xi for all i is independent of uj. So e, xi is independent of ui, xi is, i and j could be the same or they could be different. x1 is independent of u4. x1 is independent of u1. It doesn't matter if i and j are the same. That's because <laughs> This runs over all the x's down here. This goes from i equals 1 to n. And so if this is correlated with any of the x's, you get a non-zero term here. This has all the x's in it. So if this is correlated with any of these, you're going to get a non-zero term here. Anyway, so we use this to say, OK, the expected value of beta hat is beta, that's just a parameter, it's not a random variable, so we don't have to take this expectation, plus the expected value of that term, the sum of the xi minus x bar times ui over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. Then we can use this, because they're independent, we can use this fact. So this is beta plus the expected value of the sum of the xi minus x bar over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared times the expected value of the ui. Let me do this different. Might make it easier. Go back to this part. The book lets AI equal XI minus X bar over the sum of the XI minus X bar squared. So remember, you can write this beta hat is beta plus the sum of the AI UI. You remember doing that last quarter and earlier in the course? Now, now it's easier to do this. Th this is probably confusing. Now we're saying the expected value of beta hat is beta plus the sum of the EAI, EUI. I can separate these expectations because the A's only have X's in it. The A's have X's only. And those are independent of all the U's. So initially, this is the expected value of AI, UI, and I could bring the expected value inside. And then what's the expected value of the UIs? Zero. So that's zero. So the expected value of beta hat is equal to beta. So that's the unbiased argument. That's how you do unbiasedness. So it's probably easiest to do it this way rather than this way. So just, that may not be the way to do it.
So just to review, we said beta hat is the sum of the xi minus x bar. This is a formula that should have been seared into your head in the first quarter. With an open book test, I don't know if it was, but it should have been. Then beta hat is beta plus the sum of the xi minus x bar times ui over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. And we showed you how to do that a few minutes ago by subbing in from yi minus y bar. This part here is ai. So beta hat is beta plus the sum of the ai ui, where ai has this definition. Then the expected value of beta hat is beta plus the expected value of the sum of the ai ui, which is beta plus the sum of the expected values of the ai uis. You can switch these. These are both linear operators, so they're invertible. You can bring the expectation across the sum sign. Expected value of a plus b is expected value of a plus expected value of b. That's what we're using there. Okay. Then this is equal to, if they're independent, this is beta plus the sum of the E AI, E UI. That goes to zero. It's only if they're independent that I can do this. That's where the independence matters, is separating these two terms. Once you do that, this is equal to beta and it's unbiased. So that's how you show unbiased. You look at whether the x's and the u's are correlated or independent. If they're independent, then you can bring this expectation across and do them separately, and you'll get a zero there. Now that's supposed to be review. We did it once in here, should have done it last quarter. When you did things like omitted variable bias, you should have used that equation. So I'm hoping that's, that's review. Now to do the, the consistency is a little bit different. So let's do consistency. It's easier, I think. Even though it involves these mysterious thing called probability limits, I think it's easier. So again, this is asking about the estimator for a fixed n. This is like n equals 100. When we take an expected value, what we're saying is on average. So what we're saying with an expected value is if we had a sample of 100, and we went to the laboratory and did this experiment again and again and again and again with n equals 100 every time, we just kept doing the experiment with n equals 100, and we average all the times, we flip a coin, we average the time we get heads each time. If we do that experiment enough times, we flip it 100 times, okay, 47, 53, 42, 58, oh, 50, 50, oh, I got lucky that time. And we average them all, we'll get 50, 50. But each one has n equals 100. That's unbiased. It's asking about, on average, are you correct for a fixed n? Sometimes you are, sometimes you aren't. This is asking, if I flip the coin an infinite number of times, will I get the right answer? And the answer is yes, most of the time. Or well, for coins it would be. But consistency, we're asking that, that particular question. Now, we use the same formula. Let me make this u i minus u bar even. This is zero, so let me just write it. Anyway, what we want to do is evaluate what happens to this as n goes to infinity. To 
do that, we really need to, to write it in some recognizable form. So let me put a 1 over n there and a 1 over n there. That's just, um, I just multiplied by n over n. I multiplied by 1. I didn't change n. What's this an estimate of right here? That's an estimate of the variance of x, isn't it? How do you estimate the variance of any variable, w? It's 1 over n times the sum of the wi minus w bar squared. That's the estimator for the variance. So this is an estimator for the variance of x. What's this an estimate of? The covariance of x and u. So as n goes to infinity, so the p limb of beta hat is beta plus, what's this go to as n goes to infinity then? If it's an estimate of the covariance, I'm going to get the true value if I use every n in the world, right? So as n goes to infinity and I have the entire population, I'll get the exactly the right answer. So this goes to not, not an estimate, but the true covariance of x and u, and this goes to what? The variance of x. That's the variance of x. And by assumption, what's the covariance of x and u in these problems? Zero. So as long as x and u are uncorrelated, that goes to zero, and this is equal to beta. And so it's consistent if the covariance of x and u is zero. It, you also need that the variance of x is non-zero. That just means you need some spread in your x's. We already knew that. That's one of our assumptions. That there's more than one x value. So that's what we do with consistency. We're going to be using consistency, not unbiasedness. So we're going to be using. I think this argument's easier once you re, once you start to recognize these moments. And the main ones we're going to look at is the covariance and the variance. So whenever you see a form that looks like the sum of the zi minus z bar times 1 over n, what's that go squared? What's that going to go to in the limit? That's going to go to the variance of z as n goes to infinity. Or sometimes we'll call it sigma squared z. This is the other way we'll write it. And then we have 1 over n times the sum of the zi minus z bar times wi minus w bar. What's that go to? The covariance of z and w. And it's these covariance terms, we're going to, we're, we're going to end up evaluating these, these kinds of terms a lot. I won't do it. Sometimes they write this as sigma zw as the covariance, but I'm not going to use that symbol much, so I won't, I won't write it down. So let's try to use these consistency arguments to look at our first case where there's bias. So let's use these consistency arguments to look at errors in variable. In your project, you're going to want the price of houses. You may not be able to find it. You may have their square foot, square foot each. So you may want to use square feet as a proxy for size, or you may want to use other variables that are imperfect measurements. You may want um, people's income in a cross section, but the data you're using is only estimated to the nearest 10,000. So the income's measured with error. It's plus or minus something. What happens when your variables are measured with error? Does that cause any big problems? And it turns out it does. So let me take a variable xi. So let's write it as zi plus wi. 
So xi is the measured variable. This is, this is what we actually measure. This is the true value. And this is the error. <coughs> so I measure the length of this tabletop. And it has some true value. But my measured value is going to be off a little tiny bit. So it won't be measured perfectly. Now if that error is tiny, we'll see it's not going to hurt as much. But if I've got a really, really bad measurement of this table, it's only you know, plus or minus two feet, and I care about precision, I'm kind of fitting it into time and space, that, that error is going to hurt me. So big measurement errors we'll see are going to cause big troubles in our regression model. They're going to bias the coefficient. So we need to prove that. We need to prove that error measurement like this causes bias in regression models. So that's what we're showing. And we'll use these consistency arguments to do it. Whew. Stop me if you've heard this one. Okay. There's two possibilities for errors. So there's two kinds of measurement errors. One is error in the x's, and the other is error in the y's. This is not a big problem, hardly a problem at all. And I'll show that eventually. This, though, leads to bias and inconsistency. That is, this is a problem. So let us show that. So the true relationship between two variables is yi equals beta 1 plus beta 2 zi plus vi. So that's the true relationship. We're just making it two variables to make it simple. But we can't measure zi directly, or perfectly better, directly, perfectly. But we have a noisy measure. This right here, xi is zi plus wi. So we have a variable that's close to zi, but it's, it's measured with error. So this is a random variable. This is a random variable. So we're going to assume that the variance of zi is sigma squared z. We'll assume <laughs> that the variance of wi is sigma squared w. And we'll also assume that the measurement error is independent of the variable we're measuring. The measurement error would be the same whether this table was this long or this long. The, the, the error I'm making and I'm measuring isn't a function of how big the table is itself. That may, that's not always true, but it's mostly true. trying to fill a cylinder up to a certain line. It's not going to matter how high the line is up on the cylinder. Your error is going to be pretty much the same, no matter how big the variable is. So mostly, this, this is going to be true. 
So what we're going to have to do is we're not going to be able to regress yi on zi because we don't know zi. We don't have a measure of zi. What we could do is regress yi on xi, the thing that's really close to zi. Does that work? Is that OK? So let's rewrite our model in terms of these observables. So we know that zi from that equation is xi minus wi. So let's plug that into here. So yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 times xi minus wi plus vi. My x is a little skinny there. So let's write that in terms of what we're actually going to run. So yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2 xi plus vi minus beta 2 wi. And then the book calls this ui. So it says, OK, the regression you're going to run is yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x2i plus ui. So this is what you actually end up running, y on x. You'd like to run y on z, but you don't know z. You only know z with an error, so you run it on x instead. You use the closest thing you can find to it. This is what you end up with. Now here's the problem. In ui, UI has WI in it, right? That's what UI is right there. The so UI has WI in it, doesn't it? Yes, it does. XI, X, uh, I'm just writing X2I, XI, X2I, in there. XI is equal to what? ZI plus minus WI. This has WI in it. This has WI in it. What's that mean in terms of their correlation? They're correlated, so we're going to have problems. So this has WI in it. This has WI in it. So they're correlated. That's a problem. We're going to show that explicitly mathematically, but trying to get you to just see whenever x and u are correlated, you have bias and inconsistency. We haven't shown it yet. And so we can see we've got a problem because that has wi in it and that has wi in it. So let's see if we can figure out what the bias is. What exactly is the bias and what does it depend upon? So we know here that beta i, beta 2 hat, will be the sum of the xi minus x bar, yi minus y bar, over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. We regress y on x. That's how we estimate beta 2 hat. We just showed that's beta 2 plus the covariance of x and u over the variance of x. Right? We just showed that a couple seconds ago. Well, it's more than seconds. Measurement error. So let's look at those two terms. What's x equal? Z minus w, is that right? Plus, thank you. <laughs> You're right. And what does u equal? 
V minus beta W. So let's make sure this is non-zero. So the variance of X is the variance of Z plus W. which is the variance of z plus the variance of w plus 2 covariance z w. But we said a few minutes ago that these are uncorrelated. We made an assumption these were independent. So this is just equal to sigma squared z plus sigma squared. We can write these either way. So the variance of x is just the variance of z plus the variance of w. There's no covariance because they're independent. They're uncorrelated. Remember, the variance of AX plus BY is A squared variance X plus B squared variance Y plus 2AB covariance XY. So that 2AB, that's what makes it a nonlinear operator, if you know what that means. If not, ignore what I just said. So what's the covariance? Oops. <coughs> What's the covariance of X and U? Well, that's the covariance of Z plus W and V minus theta 2 W. Just putting in the definitions of x and u. Z and v are independent. Z and w are independent. It's only these two terms here that are going to be a problem. So we can say we can rewrite that as um, let me break that up. It might be easier. That's the covariance of z and V minus beta 2 W plus the covariance of W with V minus beta 2 W. I just broke this up in the two pieces. You either remember that rule or you don't. That's a 420 rule. Z and V are independent. Z and W are independent by assumption. Just of the comma W. So I'm just taking this term. I'm saying it's the covariance of that with that, plus the covariance of this. The, the, the covariance of A plus B, C plus D, is the covariance of A with C plus D, plus the covariance of B with C plus D. Then I could break these up again. This is AC plus AD, BC plus BD. So this one's going to be the covariance of Z and V, which is zero, minus beta two times the covariance of Z and W, which is zero. So this one's going to go to zero. This one's going to be plus the covariance of W and V minus beta 2 times the covariance of W and W. This one's 0 again because those are unrelated. So this turns out to be minus beta 2. The covariance of something with itself is the variance. So this is beta 2 sigma squared W. But if you just look at this original form, where was it? Um, here. You can see the only thing that's going to be correlated are that and that. It's 
only going to be correlated when you have the same terms. You're going to get minus beta 2 sigma squared w out of this. If there was another z here, then, then I'd have to worry about that. But there's only one common term. So that's the only place. All these things are independent. They're all independent random variables. So it's only if it appears in two places that you get an equivariance. So this, then, is that covariance. All right. So you're all confused. Maybe, maybe not. What can I do to help? show then we said that the P limb or the consistency of beta hat is beta plus the covariance of X and U over the variance of X. And we said okay that covariance of X and U is minus sigma squared minus, this is equal to beta minus beta 2, beta 2 sigma squared w over the variance of x was what? Sigma squared z plus sigma squared. Again, just to run through it again, beta hat is beta plus the p limb plus the covariance of x and u over the variance of x. So that's equal to beta plus the covariance of x, which was z plus w, and u, which was v minus beta 2w, over the variance of z plus w. So we just, all we're doing is saying, okay, that's, I, I'm calling this beta, they're beta 2, they should be beta 2s everywhere, sorry. So this is beta 2 minus, we said this thing on the top, you get minus beta 2 sigma squared w, it's just, this term and this term is the only thing that intersect. So you get minus beta 2 sigma squared w from those right there. Just multiply this out. You get z, v, okay, that's expected value 0 because they're not related. You get z, beta 2 w, z, w, 0 because they're not related. The expected value of z and w is 0 because they're unrelated. Then you're going to get VW, and then, oh, there's the one, minus beta 2 W squared. You just multiply this out, you get four terms. And it's only when you get a common term that you have a non-zero expectation, because they're all independent. So the only thing that comes out of this is this W2, when you multiply that out. When I multiply this one out, I get Z squared plus W squared plus 2ZW. But the cross product terms are zero because they're independent. So this becomes over sigma squared z plus sigma squared w. And remember what w is. W is the measurement error. <coughs> This is the true value and this is the measurement error. If, if the variance of this is zero, if this is always zero, what's the bias here? What's the inconsistency? Zero. So there's no problem at all if 
this has zero variance, if this isn't there. As that variance goes up, what, what happens? Let sigma squared w go to infinity. What's this? What does sigma squared w over sigma squared z plus sigma squared w? What's that go to as sigma squared w goes to infinity? If you like that, it's 1 over sigma squared z over sigma squared w plus 1. What's that go to when that goes to infinity? It goes to 1. So if you had infinite variance, what would this go to? <coughs> beta 2. What's beta 2 minus beta 2? 0. So the bigger w is, the more this is biased towards 0. So in this case, the coefficients are biased towards 0. And the bias is larger, the worse the measurement error. When the measurement error is tiny, if this is a tiny number, 0 0.00000000001, and this is like 1, this is nothing. You're off a little bit, but it's not enough to worry about. It's only a sigma squared w, your measurement error gets bigger and bigger and bigger that the inconsistency becomes large enough to worry about. And at some point, it would become important. Now, a couple of caveats here. The, this is bias toward zero. That's always true when you only have a y and an x in a two-variable model. The beta 2 will always be biased toward zero if beta 2 is positive. If beta 2 is negative, the bias goes the other way. But it's, it's, in the standard case, it's always biased toward zero. If I have three variables in my model, or four variables, or like an x2 and an x3, I don't know the direction of the bias. So this is a special case that we actually know the direction of the bias. What we do know is it is biased always, when you have measurement error, and the degree of the bias goes up as sigma squared w goes up. So that result is general. We just don't know for sure that, that the result is negative, that the bias is towards zero when it is here. So what didn't you get? Or should I go back and cover again? What do I need to? We need that brave person who doesn't think they're the only one who doesn't get things. We don't seem to have that person in here. Got it? So this tells us something about imperfect proxies. In your project, I said you're going to search for data. Oh, good. So when you say that the bias, this is... I meant consistency. Okay. It's biased too, but we haven't checked the bias. The reason is, because u is correlated with some of these x's down here, when we look at the formula, beta hat is beta plus the sum of the xi minus x bar times the ui over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. This ui is correlated with some of those things down there. And we don't know how to take those kinds of expected values. Because the expected value of A over B is not equal to A over EB. In general, that's just not true. So when this is correlated with the things in the denominator, there's no good way to take an expectation. 
but P limbs, you're fine. It is true that the P limb A over B is P limb A over P limb B. So P limbs let you do things you can't do with expectations operators. That's why we use them here. And so they're, they're way easier to work with when we have these ratios and correlations with numerators and denominators and nonlinearities and all that. We just don't know how to use the expectation operator in those cases. But the PLIM works fine. Because it's always that the PLIM AB is PLIM A times PLIM B, no matter if they're correlated or not. With an expectation operator, EA is EA times EB only if they're uncorrelated. When they're correlated, you don't know what to do, like here. And so the PLIM works for you. And so yeah, I, I was sloppy with my language there. So the hardest part of these problems is going to be evaluating this expression right here for you. That's the step that you don't seem to have in your heads. The best I can do for you is, um, let me come back to this, that the covariance of A plus B, C plus D, is the covariance of A to C plus D plus the covariance of B to C plus D. And that's the covariance of A and C plus the covariance of A and D plus the covariance of E and C plus the covariance of B e and D. You just multiply it out, basically. And look at those covariances. So you can write this into four terms. And then recognize that Z, W, anything that doesn't have the same variables in it, it's going to be zero. So when you're doing your project, invariably, you're going to want a variable you don't have. I want house size. Oh, I can't find data on house size. I can find data on income. So they're sort of correlated, but they're not the right variable. Or you can find some other variable that's sort of number of swimming pools or something like that as a proxy for house size. Those are basically measurement error problems. And what it tells you is when you use proxies for the real variable, you're going to introduce bias. So long as the proxy is really, really close, if you can show that there's a tight relationship between house size and, and what you pay for it, and it probably is, your proxy is probably pretty darn good. But if there's not a tight relationship between your proxy and the actual variable, you may be introducing quite a bit of bias. So proxies are okay, but you have to make an argument that are highly related to the variable that you want to look at. Okay, one last topic, and then we'll get the heck out of here for the day. So what if the, error, what if the measurement error is an independent variable? So suppose it's in y instead of x. This is not a problem at all. So here's the true model. QI equals beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2i plus ui. That's, that's the true model. If we had QI, we'd just estimate that. We don't have QI. What we observe is yi, which is QI plus this is the measurement error. The book uses RI here. So there's your measurement error right there. Well, if we're going to run Y on X, what are we doing? Well, let's plug in for that. So QI is YI minus RI is beta 1 plus beta 2 X 2I plus UI. Slow 
So yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 plus 2i plus ui plus r. But there's no ri in x. x, by assumption, is not related to u. That's not our problem here. And it's not related to ri either. Ri's in yi, but it's not in x. x is just some other variable. So there's no correlation between x and r. So all we did was make the error a little bit bigger. One of the reasons for having an error in your model is why is it perfectly measured. And so all this does is make it a little less efficient. It makes it a little, the error a little bigger. So you can have a little more error in your model. Your t's are going to be a little smaller. Your standard error is going to be a little bigger. But you know, so, so the, the error goes up, but there's no bias no inconsistency, it's just not a problem. Just call this UI, call this UI star, and UI star has all the properties we need for the estimator to be blue. So it just doesn't do anything important to worry about. Measurement error in your x's, big problem. If you can't measure your y perfectly, you're using a proxy for your y, oh, then that's not so bad. You still want it to be close because if you've got a bad proxy, you're going to put a whole bunch of error in your model and you're going to get insignificant t's. And you're not going to find what you want to find, but as, as a matter of bias and inconsistency and that sort of stuff, not a problem at all. Well, we'll just keep doing problems like these for a while until you get it. Then we'll do them on the computer. The solution is instrumental variables, and we'll teach you how to do that next time.